Mind Sunday service. And this year, theme is taking a deep dive. And we are partway through this powerful year of reconnecting, recreating our lives as we arise from the challenges of the past two years and turn to face many new challenges. And in order to assist us build our new lives, we've been taking deeper dives into single topics over, three, over a three week period to more fully integrate spiritual teachings. So our month for this month, the month of July, our wisdom teaching is on nonviolent communication, which is also known as compassionate communication. This is a topic so very necessary to build resilient families, peaceful, thriving communities and organizations. Our topic for session one is a language of life, which focuses on the light, of, which focuses the light of consciousness on four components, referred to as the four components of the nonviolent communication model. Our speaker today is Reverend Janet Ellis. She is an international speaker, interfaith minister, published author of Wake Up, Break the Generational Cycle, and Be Yourself. And she is a manifesting coach, specialized mm -hmm. in personal resilience, emotional and spiritual well being, leadership, and organizational renewal. Well, I know from personal experience that she has inspired many groups and individuals to make positive changes in their lives. Through her company, Janet's Planets of Empowerment, she designs and delivers inspirational workshops, seminars, and keynote presentations. Let us give Reverend Janet Ellis a warm unity welcome as she provides us with this important topic guides us through it, and then will lead us in meditation after her talk. Welcome, Janet. Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, Linda. That was just, I don't know if you heard me giggling in the background while you were introducing me. <laughs> I got tickled because you sounded so good, or I sounded so good. <laughs> it's so good to be here with all of you again, my Canada family. So I, I am just blessed with the opportunity to have my birthday month with you and, and to be able to share this process. So I'm seeing quite a few of you who is familiar with nonviolent communication. Anybody out there? Yes. Very good. Very good. And for those of you who aren't, I'm going to give you just a tidbit because of the time frame we have, but hopefully it's enough to help you dig deeper for you to be able to want to research it further for the possibility of maybe um, being able to reach out somewhere and, and find a group or a connection that would want you hungry for more information. So let me just show you what I got going on here. We have nonviolent communication book. I have four different forms that I'm working from and I can send those your way if you're interested. I have my phone going over here. Just, I gotta cover all bases for you just in case. So <laughs> here we go. So the, the, one of the things that I love about the nonviolent process and, and you'll hear it as NVC, instead of nonviolent communication, but it's the same thing. And one of the things I love about it is the connection and how I can relate it also to Unity's basic principles. I love that I can combine the two and know for myself that it's, it really resonates with me. And if you can understand that, it's, it's a, a process and a practice, just like Linda said, an ongoing practice. And it's been interesting, um, a, a cohort and I just started what we call a practice group. And what that means is there's a group of us that come together once a week. And because we have been involved in nonviolent communication for a few years, we now come together once a week to practice it because it is a practice. I mean, you absolutely have to be able to sit with somebody and work it 
just about every day as possible. Now, I'm, I'm truly blessed that my husband has been involved with this as well. Now, I'm going to get real honest with you. Do we use it all the time? Maybe not, but we do have the tools and we do know that it's there <laughs> when we remember to use it, but we're still human beings, right? Right. So anyway, um, NBC is, again, nonviolent uh, communication or is also known as compassionate communication. There are four main um, components of the process, and I would like to share that with you first. The first one is the concrete actions we are observing that are affecting our well being. Okay. So, what that means for me is that um, something that I've been learning from unity, from my understanding of my spiritual work, from my therapy, from my 12 step programs, from my everything is being in the present moment right here right now, just observing what's going on without any emotional attachment. Is that easy? No. Is it possible? Yes. But again, it takes that practice. And so the beauty of this for me is also, if we are in that position, if we are in the observing aspect at that point in, in time, I'm in the presence and the power of the one of the universe, right? Correct? Y'all not, I'm seeing all of you. So if you wanna, get, oh, and also put, if you wanna get into the chat group and statements or share, please please do that. So in, in the second unity principle, it's our essence of God and we are inherently good. No matter what we do, we are at the core of our being inherently good. So again, if I'm in that presence of who I truly am, God's precious child, and I've done no wrong, and I'm observing who I am and how I'm being in that moment, then I am the presence and I am the power of the infinite right then and there. So it is a practice. I mean, I, I, I don't know for you how long you've been in unity. For me, it's been since 1986. And that is an ongoing practice for me. That's one of the biggest ones that I have is being able to stay in the present moment to be just looking at the details of what I'm observing without any emotional attachment. And I don't know about you, but that's huge. It's absolutely a big piece that has an effect on us. And the second one is the feeling. So the four components of NVC, one is observation, two is feeling, three are our needs, and four is a request. That's basically what nonviolent communication is about. Now, going about getting that is a whole nother story. So, in one, we have the concrete actions we are observing that are affecting our well being. In two, how we feel in relation to what we are observing. Okay. So, let me see if I can find an example. Feeling I'm observing. So, yesterday, okay, I can give you this. I'm observing yesterday. And I was telling some of the ladies earlier, in Texas, it was 102 degrees yesterday. I, again, wished I was living in Canada, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> so we're on a train ride and we're going to downtown Fort Worth, which is about a 45 minute, at, well, actually it was an hour and a half ride on the train. And, and I observed the people around me. And there's this young boy on the train yesterday and he was having to entertain himself because dad was on the phone the whole time. And his means of entertaining was woo, woo, for an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> okay, do I need to say anything else about that? <laughs> so if I'm observing just the facts, there's a young boy sitting there trying to entertain himself because he, he needs to. <clears throat> what was I feeling in the time I was observing? A little irritated. And then I smiled because my husband made a comment about how strong his voice was at his young age. And I went, boy, he's such a positive thinker. <laughs> and so we went back and forth with the conversation. 
but it was it was a neat interaction that we were able to have. Then the third one again is our needs. The needs, our values, our desires. Those things that are creating our feelings. What was my need in that moment? At that moment, my need was for that child to be quiet. That was a need. Doesn't mean it had to be met necessarily in that moment, but that was my need in the moment. And I was very, very acutely aware. Now, the old me would be snarky and mumbling out of the side of my mouth to my husband going, I wish that kid would just shut his mouth. Why isn't his father taking care of him? I wish he'd put that phone down, yada, yada, yada. But what happened instead was I was able to finally look at his, through the eyes of my husband and see that the child was truly just trying to entertain. He was trying to get his needs met, right? So if I'm able to come from that perspective, it shifts my mindset completely. And I'm able to see another human being just as they truly are. A precious child of God, totally perfect and complete and being the true authentic essence that they are meant to be. He didn't care what anybody else thought about him. He was in the moment being and doing exactly what he was wanting to do and be. And so it's so important sometimes that we don't get caught up in life, those habitual behaviors that we continue to do on a daily basis and don't know that we're even, even doing them because they're so habitual. And to be aware and mindful of not only what my needs are, but the other person, possibly, possibly where they're coming from, because I don't normally do that. And, it, and it's an important piece. So the fourth one is the request, the concrete actions we request in order to enrich our lives. Now, in that example, I possibly could have said to the father, could you please pay attention to your son? I wouldn't have said that, but I'm just saying my need and my, and my um, action would be to either ask him to tell his kid to be quiet <laughs> or whatever it is that I would need to do to take action, to make that my need be met. And at the same time though, again, because I'm coming from possibly the need of the child, I didn't have, my need was met automatic. I don't have to say that, but my need was automatically met without me having to say anything at all. Does that make sense? Because I was coming from a more compassionate place about the young man and and became more compassionate for myself, which was quite powerful for me. So in nonviolent communication, it is taking care of ourselves. Anybody know how to do that? Now, I know we know how to survive. I know we know how to take care of ourselves, but self-loving processes where we take care of us instead of having the need to take care of everybody else having the need to be in everybody else's business, having the, the want to be able to fix somebody else so I might look better, those kind of things. So um, there was a time in my life, uh, probably it's been a number of years ago, um, Lynn and I both were in a situation where we both had been laid off from our jobs. <clears throat> I had been doing temp work, but not making enough to really supply a whole lot. And Len being an electrical engineer, it was a specialty and he was having a real hard time finding work. And um, I had a little bit of unemployment coming in. He had some coming in, but we were close to losing our home. And, and I don't know about you, but when you're in that kind of situation, it can, it can create havoc in your life, right? So we were really blessed by a friend of ours through church that had been involved in this nonviolent communication for a number of years and they were teaching it. And they reached out to us and they had what they called the practice group going on in Dallas at the time. And so once a week, Len and I would participate. It, it kept my sanity in place. It helped me to practice. And I'm telling you what, we're still married today because of that group. It was profoundly um, a change for me to be able to stay grounded, remember who we are, 
come from a loving space instead of reacting from a stressful space. So to me, this is one of the most important, important, important courses I've ever taken. And it's been a ritual um, for most of my, my latter part of my life. Now, let's say that, you know, once COVID kicked in, the practice group stopped and it wasn't a consistent thing that we were able to go to. And, and I dropped it, not dropped it. I kind of got l lazy about it. And so recently, um, I think we've been meeting a month now, we started a new practice group and I can't tell you how powerful that has been for us and well, for me. And it's so interesting that now that I'm back in that practice group, I remember. I remember things I need to do, how to behave, how to act, how to reach out to others. And it's, it's been a very fascinating process in that um, we get to interact with other people and practice these things on a weekly basis so that we can put it into our life on a consistent basis. So it's um, those four components are OFNR, a language of universal human needs. So again, it's observation, feeling, needs and requests. Now that sounds really easy, I know. However, it's about as easy as the five principles of unity. I got it down, I know what it is, I know what it's supposed to be, I know what I'm supposed to be doing to be that, and yet I've, I've got them down. I can, I can memorize them and read them off to you in a heartbeat. But as far as me practicing it on a daily basis, I have to be so awake and aware to remember that there is only one presence and one power in the universe, and that is God, right? <laughs> Our essence is of God. Therefore, we are all inherently good. Now, we got a lot of people asking us, how can that be with the world going on the way it is today? We are all inherently good. Now, what we choose to do with that is a whole nother story. And that is the choice or the options of the individuals that participate. So for me, in my process of wanting to be so authentic and real and not have to be hypocritical or fake or false, it is a daily practice of some sort so that what you see is what you get. If I'm cranky, you'll see it. If I'm angry, you'll see it. If I'm hurt, you're going to see it. You'll see it all because that's who I am and who I choose to be today. But in order for me to be able to stay in that presence and do it in a somewhat graceful way, it's a constant practice of something. I don't know what it is for you. Each one of you may have that choice. I know I've been in a number of different groups that have helped me, but this particular one has been the biggest blessing. And it it is a practice, you guys. I don't know about you, but one of the biggest things in nonviolent communication is to be able to define how you're feeling. And most of us don't know in our society. And, and for me as a child from a, uh, an extreme dysfunctional family, and I don't mean that in a negative way by any means, but the behaviors I learned growing up were of um, trying to stay one step ahead of the person that was abusing and to um, always you know, stay one step ahead so I can survive. And so those behaviors that we pick up from the day we are born, correct? Those people, from the moment we're infants in that bed and they're looking at us going, oh, look at my little baby from, to the point you're leaving home at whatever age, they have imbued you with their teachings. Not that they're good or bad or indifferent, but it's their teachings. And where did they learn it from? Their parents. And where did they learn it from? Their parents. How far back can I go? A long way. I mean, we're still doing nursery rhymes today, you guys. I mean, think about it. What's the, um, the Maypole dance? What was the reason for that originally? Anybody know? Yeah. 
Um, pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. That was when, yeah, uh-huh. And you know what I'm talking about. That's when there was so much death and decay that they were putting posies in their pockets so you wouldn't smell it. And we're still singing these things to our kids today. I mean, you know what I mean? It's just mind blowing to me. rock a -bye, baby in the treetop. You guys, I was scared to death the trees for the longest time. <laughs> just saying, think about what we say. So when we're automatically spewing this stuff day to day, we don't know that we don't know that we don't know what we're sharing. It's so habitual. So it takes something like unity principles, going to church on a, on a weekly basis, doing the nonviolent communication to wake us up to be consistent in that, that we really truly say we want to be. Compassionate, loving, empathetic, caring for others, loving myself, self-respect, respect for others. It's so important what we do and especially for ourselves. I can't reiterate this enough in that we still today in this society press the issue about you're being selfish you're, you're only thinking of yourself if we're doing certain things for us. Um, and we, we have to, we absolutely have to be able to connect with ourselves, do the daily meditations, do the prayers, do those tools and those steps that you know best through unity or whatever else it is that you work with so that you can be that that you truly, truly wanna be passionately and lovingly, not just half-assed, which is most of us. I don't know about you, but when I'm gonna, in unity, I got to this point where I knew everything in here. Anything you ask me about, I can tell you anything about Myrtle. Love Myrtle. Charles, yeah, but Myrtle, oh my goodness. I love Myrtle. And I can tell you anything you wanna know about Myrtle, but then ask me if I was living and walking my talk. <laughs> yeah. And that was one of the biggest things for me, the hypocrisy in churches, in businesses, in everything. The most important thing for me today is to walk my talk. Again, if I'm not being who I say I am, I want to be called on it gently, lovingly, compassionately, but I want to be called on it because it's one of the most important things for me today. So, so that being said, in order for us to be able to be those people, I go back again to the habitual teachings that we got, again, not good or bad. I know my mom and dad did the very best they could with what they knew. I also learned a great deal about my grandparents on my dad's side too, and how they didn't know what they were doing either. And so each one of us learns, and then we get to a point in our life that we either choose to do it the same way, or we choose to do it differently. And for me today, with the book I wrote and the other processes I'm doing, I'm really choosing to try and break the vicious cycle, not try, I am, breaking that cycle of the abuse and the habitual behavior that, that runs rampant in, in my family. And so the passion that I have about making those changes for me, I hope shows up in the talks that I do, in the workshops that I you know, share, in, in anything at this point in time where I am connecting with other human beings. I think I've shared this before, but my favorite is I work with teens. I love teenagers. I know it's not for everybody. Y'all can handle the little babies, y'all, y'all, oh, please. Those of you who are special with the kiddos, you go. I feel like I'm 15, 16, 17 again when I'm with those kids until one of them comes up and asks me if they can call me granny. <laughs> and then it's a whole nother story. I told them they could call me auntie, but they went, no, you remind me of your granny. I'm going, okay, great. So 
But the connection made and the importance of this information getting to the younger generations is profound. And so I've been mentoring in a high school with a program that I co-created called Mission and Vision for Work and Life. And I work with freshmen to seniors in high schools, helping them to define how they want to show up in the world. Were you ever asked how you want to be? What kind of human being do you want to be in the world? How do you want to show up as a loving, compassionate individual or a horse's butt? Uh, the horse, you know what I'm saying. It's your choice, right? Your choice. Nobody else's. You can ask everybody, but when it comes down to your work, it's your work. And so I bring to you today just a piece of the beginning of a process that is so powerful and so needed that it helps in so many ways. And I have to say, there's, okay, I'm getting real here. Get ready. <laughs> so there's a situation in my life personally, I have held on to something. I'm not gonna tell you how long because it's embarrassing. However, I've done everything I know to do to let go of this forgive, release, and all those other beautiful things that unity says and all the other practices I've done. And for some reason, there's a payoff for me in this thing because I'm still holding on to it. However, in, in this practice class, after 40 something years, I got a peek into what it was. One practice class that started up a month ago and it's taken me 42 years to finally get to a point where I can finally see why and what the payoff was for me to hold on to this crap. And that's all it is. So again, it's so important for us to know and to remember who we are, right? We are the essence of God. Therefore, we are precious. We are beautiful. That song was the bomb earlier. We are beautiful. Curves, butt, hips, everything. We are beautiful inside and out. So how are you showing up in the world? How do you want people to know you? I think it's just beautiful. We're co-creators with God. We have the choice. We have the ability to create whatever it is we want to create. Sadly, most of us are focused on the energy of the negative and continue to bring the negative because what you focus on, you bring to you. Instead of seeing the beauty, the absolute beauty of this world. I mean, what Linda shared earlier, she, she shared the image, the, oh, the hummingbird. Linda, I can't believe you got that photo. I want to copy, please. <laughs> I love hummingbirds. Just step outside your door and see, what are you grateful for? What is the beauty around you just where you are today? Right now, just observe right here, right now, where you are today. What is the beauty and the gratitude and the grace and the love in your life? It's so important to focus on the positive, not to say, Pollyanna positive. Yes, there are things in the world that are rough, but you also have a lot of stuff around you that you just don't even see because we're so consumed with our habitual behavior. Okay. So the NBC is a piece. It's just a beginning. I plan to see today. Next week, we talk even further about feelings. Get ready. <laughs> right? <Ooh. laughs> okay. So in this place right here, right now, where we are, from the love of my heart to you and your heart to me, let's take a moment and go within the silence and be grateful, connected with what you know about yourself, who you are, how you want to show up, where you want to be and how you want to be. So if you're willing, close your eyes, take a deep breath and release that energy. 
Take another deep breath and blow out all of that which you no longer need to hold on to. See the beautiful wings of the hummingbird of that image that was shared earlier? The freedom, the essence and the energy in that image of the hummingbird. We are that. We are that. Can you wrap your head around that for a moment to connect with God, your source of being? And because we are the precious children of the, of the essence of the universe, we have capabilities that we're not even aware of. And now is the time to claim it, to be it, and to do it. So I ask you to go into the silence for a few moments and just be. Be with the energy of source, be with your energy of love, compassion, and empathy of yourself and everyone else in this world, because we're all doing the very, very best we can in this moment right now, in the silence. So when you're ready, gently start wiggling your toes, your fingers, feel connected to where you are. That space of love and beauty. And know, believe and know that each and every one of you are beautiful compassionate, loving individuals. The essence and purity of source. Take a deep breath. Let it go. And when you're ready, open your eyes and come back.